So we talked about FBT this morning. What is it? Uh, in a brief synopsis, it's an outpatient treatment, pro treatment program, uh, treatment modality for adolescents with disordered eating or eating disorders. Usually, we would uh, spend six to 12 months in treatment with patients and their families and usually in the order of 10 to 20 treatment sessions. <coughs> uh, it's a complex treatment on the one hand, but uh, if we want to summarize it in a sentence or two, then it's uh, a treatment that specifically puts parents in charge of restoring normal eating for their adolescent. Uh, which is seen as appropriate control, uh, temporary control, to rescue the child from an illness that could uh, have very serious consequences and that, as I said earlier today, is ultimately relinquished just as soon as the patient's weight is, uh, is on a steady incline and the parents feel comfortable and empowered to manage <coughs> this difficult illness by themselves. So it's quite contrary to traditional clinical recommendations of parentectomy uh, that the parents' influence is bad, they need to be removed from treatment, and you work exclusively with the adolescent <coughs> and keep the parents out of the picture. It's the opposite of that. Um, a summary of the treatment style and format. Um, so the therapist is very active, as we said earlier, uh, and he or she balances this active stance uh, to mobilize the, uh, or appropriately mobilize the parents' anxiety about their child's eating disorder. And that needs to be carefully calibrated. You're going to see parents whose anxiety might be through the roof. So you're not going to increase their anxiety for them to take charge of the, of the weight restoration. You're going to decrease the anxiety and contain them. Then you're going to meet families uh, who apparently don't seem to be too moved by the crisis in which uh, the daughter or son finds themselves and you need to raise their anxiety so they can take appropriate concern. And then there's a whole smorgasbord of presentations in between. In so doing, you always show great deference to the parents' judgment uh, so that they can come up with the solutions with your guiding hand as the authoritative uh, therapist who joins the parents uh, in their attempt at overcoming the eating disorder. Uh, <clears throat> we mentioned that this treatment format has been studied uh, both in separated and conjoined formats uh, and we highlighted the fact that perhaps uh, the separated format might be more applicable for families who are highly critical of their offspring but as we also pointed out is that one of the uh, key issues around manualizing this treatment was having had this knowledge in hand uh, how specific interventions in FBT are geared towards addressing uh, parents' uh, hostility or um, criticism towards their sick offspring. Um, we highlighted that this treatment has been studied uh, in both short and long-term formats, uh, six months and 10 sessions versus 12 months and 20 sessions, and that there is, are no differences in outcome both weight-wise uh, as well as uh, the cognitive features of this disorder at both uh, end of treatment and four-year follow-up. <clears throat> so that's a, a very brief summary of what we talked about in the first part of this presentation. So what do we do then when we uh, meet with a family and engage them in treatment and embark on this course of, say, 20 treatment sessions over 12 months? <clears throat> at least at Chicago and Stanford, a lot of um, preparation uh, are taken care of prior to the start of treatment. And while we both work at uh, settings, uh, tertiary uh, a, a treatment and, and uh, educational facilities, uh, we should nevertheless attempt to have a team approach as we highlighted this morning when uh, you embark on this treatment. Uh, and that team approach will allow you to engage in a number of, of uh, important assessments before the onset uh, of the, or the start of the treatment. The first and foremost, if someone is referred to us, uh, we want to be sure that they're medically stable for outpatient treatment. So almost always the first port of call would be the adolescent medicine physician or pediatrician on the team. Uh, if it's not the first meeting, then it's certainly a meeting that takes place very soon after the family 
has come in to uh, do the assessment with us in psychiatry before they go on to pediatrics. But you really do not wish to start treatment unless you uh, are, con and this is confirmed that your patient is medically stable and fit for you to move forward. So the diagnostic interviews that are completed uh, to determine the appropriateness of the patient for treatment is not a set of questions to tick off what makes this a good case and what makes these parents not appropriate for this treatment. It's for us to understand the diagnostic picture so that we know what we're working with. And that means we do a detailed assessment of the eating disorder, its history and its current presentation, and we do a detailed uh, history of the psychiatric uh, comorbidities that, as I said earlier already, many, if not most, of our patients present with. So we want to have a clear picture of both the history and presentation of the eating disorder as well as the history and presentation of any comorbidities and any other relevant psychosocial uh, or psychological issues that we will have to uh, take into account in our treatment planning. So usually, again, at our two sites, we would be doing the EDE, or the eating disorder examination, which is a structured clinical interview, research clinical interview for the eating disorder piece and the kidney sats or the mini kit uh, as a structured uh, interview for the psychiatric comorbidity piece. So the parents are not being evaluated per se to assess whether they are reasonable candidates. But again, we are not clinically naive to think that just about every parent can do this. We, we firmly believe, and I think uh, it's backed up by our clinical expertise and by uh, robust research support that the majority of parents are perfectly suitable and capable of doing this provided that we uh, support them and find their strengths. But we also don't want to overlook some of the obvious issues that may curtail their efforts and we would be barking up the wrong tree. And those are very far and few between. Uh, I can think of one parent who presented to us with a history of psychosis and it was debatable whether that parent was uh, um, in, a, in a position to support his or her sibling at that point in time. Uh, just last week, a, a parent dropped out of treatment because as we suspected, his or her substance uh, use was far worse than we were led on to believe in the assessment uh, and it did not help in that single parent family. Uh, uh, the parent was not capable of even attending the sessions or regular sessions. So those are the few uh, clear examples where we would attempt and then realize we probably cannot successfully uh, pull those parents into treatment to help us do what they ought to be doing. We also, and I say this one uh, with a qualification, uh, ask the parents to agree to bring the entire family for treatment. Um, we appreciate that we are working and living in a society where families are at the best of times overcommitted between their careers, their family commitments, their, the various extracurricular activities of their, their families. Um, but nevertheless, we would prefer that the family who lives under the same roof come to the first handful of sessions. And we certainly would want to emphasize their presence throughout treatment. Uh, but I think we are uh, a little bit more comfortable with uh, families beginning to organize the core, if you like, family that should be at every family session forward. Uh, but in conjoint treatment, we really want to emphasize that and we don't really wish to let any family member off the hook, so to speak. Um, it's very likely that either a parent wishes to step away from this or the other siblings. Um, we make every effort that every parent should be there at every session. And if the parent finds a reason not to be there, we would call them on their mobile phones and put the speakerphone on the chair in the session and engage them in that way, but make sure that they come back the next time around. Sending the message that your presence uh, is not just welcome, it's highly desired. Um, and uh, finally, before uh, I'll talk about the three phases and then get into the role play, um, an important piece is that nutritional advice is not provided directly to the patient. Jim said earlier today that everyone who treats patients in this treatment modality should have a very sound understanding of what happens to the body and the mind uh, when you are starved. That doesn't make you uh, an expert in nutrition all of a sudden. There are experts called nutritionists and dietitians. Uh, but the potency of the treatment really sits in the hands of the FPT therapist who shouldn't in the session defer uh, 
to other colleagues is because you don't know that uh, in a uh, very emaciated adolescent, as many as four to 7,000 calories a day might be required. You need to know that. You also need to know what an acute state of starvation does to metabolism as well as what it does to the mind. Uh, and with that knowledge, you will come across as far more confident and capable of uh, comforting the family that you have what it takes to, to contain them and uh, guide them through this uh, difficult road forward. So we alluded to the three phases of treatment uh, earlier today. So let me just remind you of what these three will look like, or typically looks like rather, before we go into the role play. And the role play would be, although there's not time for uh, a session from each phase, what is very critical about this treatment, as for many other treatments, is the way in which you engage a family from the outset and get the ball rolling from the outset. There's a fairly robust literature demonstrating the um, beauty of um, good outcome if you can bring about desired changes early on in treatment in psychopharmacology trials. And we have now uh, one or two studies available for this treatment as well, very clearly demonstrating that uh, if you support the family to help them help their daughter or son gain about four pounds by the fourth week of treatment, um, you have about an 80% chance of a good outcome. Um, so it's a very clear indicator that, um, like in any other good treatment, you need to work very hard from the get-go to make things happen. Um, families are enormously encouraged when they begin to see the results very quickly. Now, just a, a, to take note, too, that we talked about the J-curve, and sometimes things have to uh, get a little worse before it starts getting better because that would be a more realistic expectation. But it shouldn't deter us as clinicians from uh, aiming to bring about quick and dramatic weight gain in order to hold the, the family and bolster their, their commitment and empower them to take this road forward. So therefore we're going to show you um, at least uh, the first session and some of the critical pieces that you have to achieve in those first uh, session. So there are three phases of treatment, as we said earlier. If we take a 20 treatment module, uh, a model um, and we divide into three phases, that the bulk of the work is in the first phase of treatment, where you just relentlessly work towards helping the parents, understanding this disorder, not to engage in anorexic debate with their offspring, uh, but meticulously and persistently work towards convincing him or her to take the amount of food that they as parents know the child has to eat in order to gain weight at a tempo of about one to one and a half pounds per week on an outpatient basis. And you stay with phase one and, and, and aim to achieve all those goals as, er, goals as early as possible uh, before you can move on to phase two. And if you take, say, the average uh, adolescent with anorexia present at around 80% of expected body weight, you would expect to have the parents move them forward by about 10 percentage points to about 90 percent, on average, uh, percent expected body weight by the time you might be ready to move to phase two. So it's both a numerical cut point that should not be seen as that rigid, uh, coupled with uh, a sense that you can, uh, a sense of a change of mood in the family. That means the family has now demonstrated that they feel much more capable of managing this disorder. And the adolescent's urges to starve herself have diminished sufficiently that if the parents begin to take a step back, that the patient's weight won't be sliding in the opposite direction. Only then do you begin to carefully hand control back to the adolescent, and as I said this morning, in an age-appropriate fashion. Age 12 doesn't look the same as age 17. And then finally, in the third phase of treatment, you don't do family therapy per se, you don't do a therapy to uncover where this illness is coming from. By this time, the parents are now quite empowered and feel very comfortable to manage a very awful and awkward dilemma that their child has found themselves in for the past year or so. Clearly, they must have the skills to, to cope with any other adolescent concern that may come their way going forward, whether it's experimentation with uh, dating or uh, substances or any other typical adolescent challenge that most parents have to uh, cope with. And so this is the point where uh, we then move on to uh, a role play. Um, 
So while they set things up, uh, time for questions, or they will break your filming? We can take questions. We can have that on tape. OK. All right. So one or two questions, just a, a lingering query before we get into some of the clinical nitty gritty. During this whole phase, are you using any type of antidepressant, anxiety mm -hmm. issues, or you know, pharmacology? Right. So about about fifty percent, on average, patients who present to either of our facilities would already. Uh, rightly or wrongly be diagnosed with uh, comorbidity. Sometimes patients are put on, on psychotropics to help with the eating disorder. Um, so our job is first and foremost to learn whether that regimen is appropriate and uh, certainly uh, take a different tack if they were on fluoxetine because that <coughs> somehow helps with anorexia. So if someone comes to us on meds, we would make that evaluation and the child psychiatrist on the team will manage that going forward. If someone comes to us and we can't detect or don't detect a comorbid disorder at the assessment or even session one or two, but it becomes apparent later on that we might have missed something or indeed uh, a serious uh, anxiety, symptoms of anxiety or a mood disorder might be budding, we certainly would defer or refer to the team psychiatrist and start uh, medication if that's appropriate. Yeah. Uh, is there a concern mm. about the weight with being able to take something like a serotonin uptake and actually have it function well? Yeah, so le yeah, let me add just a bit to what Daniel said. Most of the time I'm taking kids off medicines. Um, in the early phases of treatment, anxiety and depressed looking features are present in anorexia nervosa and most of the time they get better as the behaviors improve and the weight improves. So we would normally try and not start a medication, even for a comorbid condition, until we had gotten them up to about at least 85 or 90 percent. And not only because of the precursors, which is what you're referring to in the use of fluoxetine, you need to have uh, the precursors for serotonin, and so the, the, it, but also because we think that the confusion diagnostically uh, around anxiety symptoms and depressive symptoms um, is really a common problem. Even, even we've done the assessment. We do most of our own assessments and so people have learned that basically I'm going to take them off <laughs> until I see after the kid is already making progress that they still need it. Right. Um, While you're functioning at such a low weight your mind definitely is not functioning well to begin with. Yeah. It's under the yeah. starvation mode. So Exactly. Yeah. I think the only clear indication is someone comes to you with a long pre-existing mood anxiety disorder and um, but for the most we, we would attempt to first see what happens with weight gain uh, and how many times would we have confirmation that those symptoms would abate once uh, weight goes up.